Hello and welcome everyone to the 2000 subscriber special in which I try to make something with the number 2000. So my first idea was I could do some process that involves the quantity of 2000 of something, you know, like making 2000 samples in some way or something like that. But then I thought to myself, okay, that's a huge number that would take a long time and maybe it wouldn't really be very interesting either. So the other idea that was also suggested by my girlfriend and my friends was that I could reference the year 2000 because it is the millennium and I'm a millennial myself. Also the Y2K aesthetic is kind of nostalgic to me. It is also referenced in pop culture a lot like in this case here PC music, hyperpop and stuff. Let's pause this video for a while and look a little bit closer at the graphics. We have these oversaturated colors just like a lot of music videos from 2000. We have these obnoxiously skeuomorphic interfaces that kind of resemble something that you would have seen in VST plugins back then a lot. Like something that really doesn't try to bring the positive sides of digital interfaces into the foreground but just embrace analog gear fully. On top of that, the Y2K aesthetic is often referenced in popular music production topics in the form of like the artifacts that we consider valuable when making lo-fi, which more and more tends to go into the mp3 direction with plugins like this that are essentially made to use two different mp3 encoders in creative ways. And yeah, I think that's definitely a trend that we will see more and more. But there are also problems, which is first of all that I never made historic content yet. Also, I don't really keep track of dates a lot like even in my own everyday life that's just not something i'm very good at i do write the date and time down of the music that i export from my door but that's about it also i need to hurry because of reverse psychology which i did not consider when i made this post in which i told everyone to subscribe slower everyone suddenly subscribed faster and now i have to really quickly make this video happen but yeah i mean it's still not rushed i worked two days on this script so my idea was i could find out which plugins have been released in the year 2000 and then somehow get those plugins and use them in a video. The problem is no plugin dev ever puts the release date of their plugins on the website and even like github pages and stuff like that they don't really have a release date visible anywhere. Yeah I, I don't know why no page ever has that. We could check out other pages that might give us this information. So I looked at pluginsforfree.com and kvraudio.com because those are the pages that are typically known for already having existed a long time ago. Even though plugins for free says it is 2024, but I know that this page is much older. It was called VST for free before, but it had to rename itself at some point because of some copyright problem or something like that. So let's look at the plugins for free search features. Here we can search for a plugin. For example, Beatburner, which I know is a very old plugin, even though I don't know if it's from 2000. And then we could see when the comments have been made. And if we find a comment that is really old, then we know that this plugin must have been at least that old. So 2015, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. So this is at least 14 years old. But yeah, we cannot really know if it is even older, maybe. So this is not a very reliable way of finding out which plugins are the oldest. Also, you know, we would have to look at all of the plugins on this website to do that. And that would take a long time if we don't have like a web bot or something. So what else can we do here? We can search by developer. And if we happen to know that some of these developers are really old because we remember them from earlier times, like Forefront, and then we can still not do anything because there is a server error. Oh, okay. Um, I know that this feature usually works, but yeah, even then it would be a little bit tedious to come up with a way to find out which plugins are the oldest. We do have a last added feature, but it will not automatically make plugins pop up when being clicked. You still have to type something in like, I don't know, resonator. And then you would see the latest resonators and yeah, I mean, that's okay. If there are just three plugins, then you can just go there and check out which one was the oldest. These two look pretty old. Yeah, I won't do that now. I just want to say that this is not a very nice way to figure out what was the oldest plugin. There is also the way that you can just click on random here and then it will show some really old plugins. Oh, the blow graphics. That's a really good plugin. Also quite old. I don't think it's that old, but a little bit old. Yeah, so sometimes you find some real gems with this feature as you've just seen and a lot of times older stuff but you know 
more time passes, the more you also just find newer stuff. So this is also a very tedious way to find really old stuff. Let's for now forget about plugins for free and just go to KVR instead. There you can go to the plugins area and KVR actually has the feature that you can click on oldest and then you are given the oldest software on the web page. You can even add even more restrictions like no plugin hosts or only Windows or only VST, no VST3 because the old software had no VST3 anyway. And then you are given a bunch of plugins which are definitely old. And as you can see down here, KVR Audio Inc. 2000 to 2024 means that theoretically the first entries in this plugin list should be from 2000, except if the page already existed way before plugins have been added to it. Maybe it was just a forum in the beginning. I don't know. That could also be. So we still have no certainty here. So here we are on the page of the oldest plugin, Tasman, and I try to find out when it was released and even here on KVR, which is a page that has a lot of site information about the plugins, I cannot really see when it was released and who is the minus one th person who owns this. That makes no sense. And what does this mean? 30 days, seven days yesterday. Is this like how many people have watched this page or what? Uh, it's definitely not when it was released. Comments. Yeah, so KVR has a lot of features, but one feature that it doesn't have is just simply telling you when it was added, the plugin. That's kind of weird. Or I'm just not seeing it. Then it's a web design problem. I don't know. Interesting though that such an old plugin was already physical modeling, something that only became really popular lately due to increased power of CPUs and stuff. Would be cool to see how this thing performs, but it's a little bit too expensive for me. So then I was basically wondering how I could find out how old a web page is maybe or a sub page of a web page and I asked ChatGPT and also a few other people and I was given a few options. One of them is to use the Wayback machine which you probably all know the Internet Archive. You could look at uh, site notice data. You could use SEO tools. You could contact the website owner. You could check the source code. You could simply Google it. Okay, I don't know, source code, let's try that, I am a programmer after all, CTLF, date, what, where is the date, what is even this interface, I don't even, date, an error occurred, yeah, I, I don't know how to use this, it's, um, I'm not enough of a hacker to use the source code to find the release date of a plugin on KVR. There is also no time to learn an SEO tool, whatever that is, or to contact the web host of various websites. I don't even know if I can even reach out to pluginsforfree.com at all because I once tried that and didn't get a response. So I don't know, I guess KVR would be easier, but I don't wanna contact people actually. That's that kind of sucks. So it's time for the Wayback Machine. And what I did was I took this link, put it into the Wayback Machine, and then was given the information that it was saved first in 2012, which is 12 years ago from 2000. So yeah, either this plugin has only been released around 2012 and then been saved to Wayback Machine, or whoever worked for Wayback Machine back then, didn't care about plugins until 2012. It's really unclear if that is the case or anything else. Yeah, so I'm not sure if we can use the Wayback Machine for something like that. So at this point I felt a little bit unmotivated about my plan to check out old plugins simply because it was so hard to find out when a plugin is even released at all. And you know, the funny thing is, even in this modern age, 2024, it is still really hard to find out and I'm also guilty of that. I also haven't written down the release dates of all of my plugins yet uh, and I should really start doing that in the future because I don't like things to be like that but I didn't think of it yet. But it's also not my own fault, at least not entirely because it's uh, I think someone could have thought about that before me because there have been so many developers and plugin development pages before I got into it. I feel like someone before me could have thought about this, but now it is my turn, I guess. Anyway, I changed my idea to just try plugins with a number 2000 in them. So I went to plugins for free and searched for that and I found, um, what is this, three phase modulation oscillators and an analog oscillator. Is this a synthesizer or what? Looks pretty cool. I found the Transcendental 2000, which looks a little bit like a MOOC. 
Is it a drum computer? No, no. Yeah, pretty cool, but also not too exciting actually. What do we have here? ZMZ 2000 fake synth emulation. Fake unit architecture. It does look kind of interesting. Still, that wouldn't have been very exciting. I feel like, you know, just th these three plugins, three synthesizers, that wouldn't have been enough. But then, gladly, I found this Reddit in which someone said that you can actually just type before or after in the YouTube search to only be shown results from before or after some year. And that's pretty powerful because usually YouTube gives you a kind of a random selection of videos when you search something based based on your interests and stuff, not just based on your search terms. So that makes it really hard to pinpoint what you want to have sometimes. But with these features, I should be able to find at least the first ever plugin videos, right? BST plugins before 2001. So we can see this works because apparently there were no videos about VST plugins before 2001. So this, at this point I could stop the video, there are no plugins before 2001. Or at least no videos about them, but I don't because now it's time for compromises. Is there at least something in 2001 or in 2002 or in 2004, three, I mean, and so on and so on. Now in 2005, so before 2006, there is the first video that has the VST plugin tag in it for some reason. I am Jesus. <laughs> I'm gay. Sexy day. Some kids who plays with a plushie in church. Okay, cool. So let's go on. And now it's getting interesting. Now we got a really not just one result, but a lot of interesting stuff. For example, a video about installing VST plugins in FL Studio. What's up everybody, NFX here with another tutorial. Hmm. And, this tu and this is kind of cool because this, this gives us a little bit of a view into some of the earliest tutorials ever. And it's de definitely a different style than nowadays. No webcams and cool transitions and stuff, very cheap mics from some webcams or something, very unprofessional, but just everyone who really wanted to talk about it without a professional background or motivation. That's very refreshing to see. Install them into and hit uh, sound by big companies. The other time, nor the first place I want to talk about. So this is where I stopped the video when I saw this, because this can give us an idea at least what kind of plugins existed in this guy's folder before 2007. And that's also very interesting. I made a list on my to-do list of the things that I found when scrolling through the different moments where he scrolled to a different place in this folder. He went to different places throughout this video and I took some of the highlights out of there that of plugins that I remembered myself. So here is one of these highlights, Ambience, which is a reverb that I really like to use a lot of years ago and I forgot that it existed. It had this peculiar quality versus CPU knob where you had to select if well if it should take a lot of CPU and it wasn't even a big difference. It was a reverb, had a good workflow and I remember that I was always quite happy with the sound. He also had Camel Crusher in his folder which is a popular distortion plugin still. A lot of people still know it. Of course he had the iconic Delay Llama in his folder. Like who wouldn't obviously. He also had the MDA effects and just as this text here on this guitar page suggests the MDA processing plugins were available many years as closed source freeware but then they were open sourced in 2015. But yeah, that doesn't mean that they were released in 2015. They are actually much older, as you can see. By the way, if you are interested in a reinterpretation of an iconic MDA audio plugin, then you should check out my plugin Overdrive Renew, in which I took the original algorithm of MDA Overdrive, gave it another parameter and also some other features like a gate, and I swapped the filter with a filter that I just like more and stuff like that, oversampling, blah, 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 blah. Check it out. What else do we have? Oh, we, are, we have a server error again. No, this time it works. Forefront bass, forefront e piano, forefront piano, forefront road. Those were also plugins that he had in his folder, and I remember them to be really old as well. And they had no parameters. This plugin has no settings.
cool. Then you had Mr. Ray in it, a Rhodes piano. This is also a physical modeling synthesizer. And it sounds really good. I should actually download it again. I do that now. Now I will talk about Room Machine 844 a little bit, which is like an early reflection simulator with a lot of parameters. So this is like just the early reflections part of a reverb. At least that's how I always perceived it when I use it. It's a really good plugin to give something a new space without actually making it sound reverberant. I used it on a lot of stuff back then. When Steinberg, uh, uh, you could uh, belong... He's also on the website of Tweakbench for some reason. Also really good plugins, a lot of 8-bit chip tuny stuff. And obviously it's just beautiful, this really old FL Studio interface. Let's check out this Delay Lama video. Mm, petite experience. Oh. So what do we have here? A really old version of Ableton, I guess. Nice. By the way, I will link all of these videos in the description if you just want to check them out yourself or other resources that were used to create this uh, video. This video then serves as the resource for my attempt at being a plugin archaeologist. Do, 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 do. Check out this video. Building up a track and adding a real-time plugin inside of Pro Tools. So I found multiple videos of this guy. I don't know if he still makes something. Last video 70 years ago. Okay, so he's not really active anymore, I guess. But yeah, back then he apparently made a lot of videos about Ableton and Pro Tools. And in this video, he's just talking about how cool it is that you can use real-time plugins in general. I've got a few tracks laid out here already. I'd like to add in some vocals to my track and help the vocals blend in by... Blah, blah, blah. And at the end, he loads a compressor. Limit the dynamic range of a track. And in this case, when the vocalist gets really loud, the compressor is going to automatically turn her down a little bit. The greatest part about using plugins in Pro Tools is you can use them all over the place in all wow. sorts of different tracks. And you can put Pro Tools in loop playback so you can just get the... Isn't it kind of cute? how excited he is about something that is so normal for us nowadays. And you know, nowadays this wouldn't have been even, you know, good enough for a video. Just putting compressor on vocals, you would have to have something more fancy to show the people. Like at least something like multiband split the vocals and then compress only the mid-range or use the sidechain input of the vocals to just let the compressor only react to the mid-range or something like that. Or, you know, reducing sibilance or the proximity effect in vocals. Something more specific that really justifies making a new video for it. But back then, there had been no videos yet. So you could make videos about the most basic things and be super excited about it. And it would be 100% professional and legit. That's kind of cute. What do we have here? Microsoft Sam thinks about Windows XP. I'm weightless. I'm a softless <laughs> oh man, that's pretty cool. So what do we have here? I have no idea what exactly he is doing, but apparently something with a synthesizer patch and it looks a little bit like it is some sort of synth edit-ish thing or some pseudo modular environment on a computer, not exactly a plug-in, but definitely audio software, even though it says VST and energy, but it's not entirely clear what is meant. Let's check out the latest video five years ago by this YouTuber that looks like it has something to do with music. Software, I mean, this might also be about software, but it looks like it's more about performance. So let's look at this one. Okay, source code. Okay, the notes are in between the 12 tone scale. So I guess this is some sort of a microtonal thing, even though it didn't sound very microtonal to my ears, but I don't have absolute pitch. So it might have been microtonal a little bit. Not entirely clear for me what this video tries to tell me, but cool. What do we have here? Kirsten Testing by Johan Lasby. I hope I pronounced that right. Thank <laughs> you. 
this was basically like a synthesizer or something where you can import a drum break and it will come up with good slice points and then you have some parameters that I don't really understand that can rearrange the slices in cool ways. So basically a granular plugin that is a little bit offline-ish with its processes. And yeah, this has been 17 years ago in 2006 testing my little beat slicer VST. This must be one of the first videos in the history of YouTube where a plugin developer just shows some work in progress plugin and that's a really important historic moment I think. So we shouldn't underestimate this video, especially considering that granular effects like that are still popular today or maybe even more so than back then. Like sound design is really huge nowadays. So this guy definitely was ahead of his time, even though the interface doesn't really look like he was, to be honest. Check this out. Think of it as a way to recreate the exact uh, weight random to something happens, something doesn't. So if I move this up, you can see it changes and the turns it back on. That's kind of funny. I mean, it's basically almost the same plugin. It looks better and it has an aim break in it. It is basically a break core plugin. Breaks are just sick so they cannot ever run out of fashion um, too much. But I still think it's kind of funny that people back then basically had the same idea, which is that simply aim breaks are sweet and that we should make plugins for making aim breaks really nice. Let's go on. Squawk attack. This is a test of uh, Skag attack, which is stupid, stupid, Glitch effect, stupid thing. Best plug-in advertisement ever. Seriously, this thing is pretty cool. You know what it is? I will scroll forward. Let's go review the audio. It It basically takes the input audio and then it freezes it granularly to play the pitch that you are playing with your keyboard. And if you know I wish, then you know that this is basically the same concept. I wish is a little bit more complex because it also has a formant parameter, which I find pretty cool, and a few modulators. But the basic idea is the same idea. It is you can freeze something to make something noisy become a certain pitch, just like the text says, make music for noise. Yeah, plugins like this are now sold for $99. So this really old idea still works and if you want a free alternative you can always go to full bucket music and just get grain strain which has a little bit more of a nerdy interface but it also works the same it also has these features it lacks the form and control but that's a little bit gimmicky anyway it has the most important features of this idea check this out as any normally ambitious person you're wondering how to maximize your profits and performance doing what you like what is music this? Hi, my name is Scott McDonald. As a private consultant from an independent company, I urge you to watch this tutorial about Ohm Forces Predatome. So this must be one of the first videos ever where someone tried to make a funny plug-in review of Ohm Force. And you know, it is really, it, 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 is, it has a lot of depth. Here is your customer. Super cool. Here is your guitar track. Awesome. Now between these two entities, there's a relation. Who can tell me what we need here? We need a bigger arrow. Oh dear, what a terrible accent. That's right, dude. We need a bigger arrow. <laughs> oh man, that's just great. And at some point they go on to actually talk about the plugin, but they don't do that in a sterile way. They do it in the coolest way possible. For this, we'll start with a very classic synth sound. Well, okay. We'll have played it via the best classic synth from this side of the galaxy. Oh, yeah. But you should be able to have something not too different with anything providing two oscillators and a filter. Just set both oscillators to triangle with the setting you can see here. That's just, it has so much style. It's just incredible that they came up with this presentation back then. Why didn't I not subscribe to them yet? Oh yeah, I remember. If I pulled that right down into the same sort of frequency of probably where the guitar is, they just stopped doing it with lots of style and became more of what a tutorial is nowadays. I would still sub, but they should know if they are watching this. I mean, this video is pretty old, but if you ever plan to make a new video, please go back to your initial style. It was a unique style and it needs to live on forever. What's this?
Holy frame rate. Wow, real life footage. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So apparently the plugin that was used in this video at some point, even though you have to really search for it to where it pops up. Oh yeah, at the end here, Aventus. It was made by this guy, Gino Corte, or however it is pronounced. Find it here on softplug.com. Again, links in the description and everything. And you can still buy it if I can see that correctly. Uh, you can download it, but only the demo and you can buy it for $40. If it was released today, it would be a free plugin, I think. But yeah, back then it was something special and it does have a great trance sound. So I guess it was really worth the cash for a lot of people. Then I found this video. Now, what I found interesting about this video is that I didn't know the plugin and that it sounds a lot like a lot of modern sound design where you just try to fuck shit up as hard as possible. And it looks a little bit like Synplant with this design. Synplant is also really old, so it would make sense that they maybe influenced each other. I tried to find out who made Sonic Destructor and I found out that it was apparently made by TC Electronic, the same guys who also made the TC Electronic native bundle that came with this plugin and I remember I used it, a DSA, a filtrator. So filtrator, not to be mistaken with infiltrator too, of course. Why is there no image? Whatever. Is a filter plugin, as you probably have guessed. So I remember how it worked. You could set a base value for the filter and then you could dial in the LFO depth and also the envelope depth. What was that for? Was it an envelope follower? I can't really remember the shape of the LFO, some basic IO settings. One of the plugins that really showed me that it can be fun to attach a filter to a modulator. This plugin showed me this back then. So that was pretty cool. Can you still buy this bundle? Uh... I don't understand this page. Oh, where to buy? No, no, I'm not in the mood for something like that. So here we have a prehistoric recording session with, I guess this is Cubase SX maybe? Really hard to tell. common theme throughout the various videos that I found from the early days of music production YouTube videos is that the people really didn't care about stuff clipping massively. I have no idea why. I always assumed that people in the past were very turned off by clipping because old people nowadays are often like that and say, mm, yeah, dynamics are so important. Nowadays, music is so squashed and ugly. But actually, clipping, when being used more deliberately as an effect, is not used as hard as it is in this recording. And it's also used on material that is more fitting for it so i feel like it would be unfair to say that the clipping nowadays sucks more than it sucked back then but yeah it's pretty cool to see this workflow just how he clicks on another track and then goes on with this recording that could potentially sound good if the sounds were good and if it didn't clip massively now this is interesting one of the first muso talks ever I don't know if they ever upgraded their intro music. It seems like it was always the same. And to the ones here who don't know what Musotalk is, that is a podcast, a German podcast about music production. So if you don't know what it is, then it is because you are not German and you should learn the German language right now. Download Duolingo right now and learn German and then come back. Heute ist Cubase 4 angeklickt. Unser Cubase 4 was just released when this video was released. So it was even before the iconic Cubase 5 that has been cracked 
more often and I guess only FL Studio has been cracked more often than Cubase 5. So here is a bit of a funny thing. Was mir immer wieder auffällt, wenn ich im Cubase Mixer bin, ähm, dass mir der Sound unheimlich gut gefällt. Ich glaube, das ist einfach der, der Mixer mit dem besten Sound. Auf he just said that he thinks that the mixer in Cubase is the mixer with the best sound. It's kind of funny that at some point he was like one of those people who think that DAWs have different sounds. It's kind of cute. But yeah, we all started somewhere, I guess. Auf jeden Fall aber gibt es jetzt Instrument Tracks. Das heißt, ich brauche keine MIDI-Spur mehr. That's also kind of funny. That instrument tracks weren't a thing back then. I also remember them not being a thing in the beginning. Back then you had to make a MIDI track and then add a VST instrument and then tell the MIDI track that it should take the sound from the VST instrument. So you could not just add another VST instrument and then automatically the door knows that you want to write MIDI for it. It could just be there for no reason. I guess it makes sense because the idea was, I guess, that you can layer multiple instruments with the same MIDI but the workflow just wasn't very good and at some point Cubase realized that and they were very proud of this new feature. Yeah, that's also kind of cute. <laughs> So this must have been one of the first plugin trailers that doesn't really tell you what the plugin is. A trend that we now see in almost every plugin, unfortunately. Car synth, at least the name gives it away a little bit. And when you go to the web page, you see that it's indeed about modeling what a car would sound like. Uh, at least that's what I think. I cannot read the text. And yeah, this download link doesn't work. If you think it does, it doesn't, unfortunately. I would love to hear what it sounds like. Okay. Okay, let's Today let's we're start. going to be explaining how to set up a sidechain kick to a bass in Cubase SX3. So now why am I showing you this? Because I remember how complicated it was to set up sidechaining in old versions of Cubase. And I want you all to see that because it might get forgotten if people are not remembered of this. The whole concept of sidechain, how it allows her basically to start this off, we need to create a group channel. And so this is already where it starts. You cannot just add a sidechain effect in your effect chain and then route something to it, but you have to make a group track that serves as, you know, the host of being able to sidechain in some way. We need to create what's called a quadro group. It's in the it's in the more menu. And it could not be a normal stereo group or something. You have to select the quadro group because the quadro group has four inputs so that you can have two main inputs and two sidechain inputs, which technically made sense, but it's very nerdy to do that. And you know, you don't really ha wanna have to do that when you are just setting up sidechain input. And nowadays no door ever still forces you to do that. So go to, and then from there we need to create a, in VST connections, F4, uh, we need to create two child buses. What? You need to create this in SX3 as, as opposed to SX2, and that's why we're, we're kind of creating this tutorial is because we need to do this, this different thing. I don't even remember this step, but that sounds hella annoying. So from here, we need to open up the mixer, and in inserts from the group channel, we need to create, uh, we're using the compadre today, because I think it gives the most graphic representation in sidechain mode. Mm, and fair. in order to activate the, 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 the kick, being on the left and the right surround, we need to use the key in button there. So with key in, it'll be in sidechain mode and we're ready to go. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good workflow for back then. Even activating sidechain in Pro C is one click more than this. So that's pretty good. So now what we need to do is we need to route the bass to the stereo input of the group channel. This is also great. Group one, stereo, stereo LS, RS. This is all just technical terms. It doesn't really tell you what you try to do. It doesn't say sidechain input of this plugin. It is just cryptic. It's not the workflow that encourages you to use sidechaining at all. So we write it there on the top of the channel. We need to send to the left and right surround. Now another sub menu where you have to do something with this whole buses layout thing. What we're doing, we lower the threshold. You can visually see. Yeah, works. Cool. But yeah, definitely a terrible workflow. Gladly, even Cubase has come up with new workflows for adding sidechain inputs. But it's still problematic because at least in the version that I have, which is Cubase 9.5.3, they do not allow VST2 plugins to have a sidechain input. And that was pretty annoying when I upgraded from my cracked old copy of Cubase SX 
3 to alleged copy of Cubase 9.5.3, I was not only forced to get rid of my 32-bit plugins, but also when I bought an actual legit VST2 plugin, I could not use its sidechain input, which for example is the case for Native Instruments Freak, which has a sidechain mode, a dedicated sidechain mode, that you can use the ring modulator, the frequency shifter and the amplitude modulator for sidechain stuff, which is pretty cool. And I was super hyped about it when I got this plugin and then I was disappointed because it has no VST3 version. Maybe it has one now, but it didn't have one back then. And that was really annoying because then I could only use two thirds of the plugin basically. Um mit Reaper die erste Home Recording Aufnahme zu machen, muss zunächst eine neue Spur hinzugefügt werden. So here we see a really old version of Reaper. It doesn't look anything like what Reaper looks like right now. If you see old versions of Ableton, they actually look pretty much the same nowadays as they uh, looked like back then, which is fascinating. But Reaper, they just look completely different in my opinion. So yeah, this tutorial is not very interesting. He's just making a recording and then he saves it as a WAV file. The recording doesn't even contain any noise except the noise of his computer. Yo, why is my internet so laggy? Anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter. I, that was the last video that I planned to show you anyway. At this point, you can scout for old plugins and stuff yourself. Let me know in the comments um, which method you would use to find old plugins or information about how old a plugin is. And, you know, anything that could be interesting for historically restoring the information that could get lost over time. Because I feel like it's our times are still young enough to keep track of these kind of things. Things, but if we are not careful about it, then we might run into a situation in which the information is pretty much lost. And then we can only tell the people of the future that VST plugins existed and they have to believe us and some won't believe us because there are not, there is not enough evidence. And this is just going to be so ridiculous that we need this to stop from being about to happen. Uh, so yeah, let me know if you have any ideas about that. And also let me know if you felt nostalgic about some of the content, no matter if you are even old enough to remember those times or if you are younger but still feel like that looks nostalgic to you uh, or whatever other feelings it invoked thoughts and stuff like that and yeah also of course this was a 2000 subs special so my next goal obviously is to have 3k so if you have not subscribed yet then you should definitely change that as fast as possible and you will not be disappointed because my content is going up in quality every day or every time I make content I always try to learn new stuff about making content and about making beats and about making plugins and this is what my future content will continue to be about but even better.